unless this nation is made up of people who do the right thing when nobody's looking. Yeah, I see. It will be ungovernable. Yeah. Because one of the mistakes often made, I think by, well, uh, one of the mistakes that's often made is the belief that somehow the law will fix things. Yeah. There are two great sa saviours uh, that people think are going to save us, education and the law. Now, as uh, I think it was G.K. Chesterton said, if you educate devils, you'll end up with educated devils. Education is a wonderful thing, but it won't save us. It you create clever people that won't create good people on its own. Now, the other thing is about the law. People think, well, if we pass sufficient laws, we will force people to do the right thing. And again, law matters. That's perfectly true. Uh, and uh, it, it does serve a function. But you cannot ex so exalt the law as to think that by having laws, you are going to create good people who will keep the law even when you're not watching. The taxation laws of this country, I believe, are so fast, so complicated. Why? Because clever people keep breaking them yeah. or getting around them. That is absolutely right. Then you have to make a new one. That then you have to make a new right. one. Yeah, it's almost a game. We uh, need people. Gaming the system is, you know, is, is, is become a national uh, uh, sort of art form. We need um, people <clears> who, like my father, pay their taxes without trying to buck the system. And then, then everyone will pay lower taxes. Everyone will pay lower taxes and without having to be checked up on. Mm. So if people won't do what they should do voluntarily, we end up seeking to coerce them. We do. And, it won't and work. then what's missed is that freedom is lost. And freedom is seriously lost. Yeah. If you want to have a great nation, make America great, it's really make America good. Because the goodness... Now, don't forget I'm talking about human beings both being both bad and good, but we do need that which is good to triumph in order for the system, for a democratic system to work. It well, work otherwise. you yourself actually said in 2005 that true freedom can only be found in a moral society. Furthermore, a moral society can only arise when we understand the truth about human nature, that it contains evil as well as good. So, and you've said it again, really, the more yes. we depart from true morality, doing the right thing by our neighbour yeah. without coercion, no. the more we can expect freedom to decline. And we will have a corrupt society. But, you know, lots of ideologies claim to present a better way forward. So you think of liberalism, Marxism, feminism, conservatism. They'd all claim to be standing for justice and freedom and equality, at least in terms of what they said to their potential voters. Yet they often advocate radically different sorts of societies, uh, liberalism and communism in particular. Why is it that everyone claims to be in favour of justice, freedom and equality, and yet have very different views on what they might look like? This is a real problem. We don't agree yes. on what these things might look like. Yes. And, um, John, I have to say, I don't know. I will give my opinion for what it's worth, but these are complex issues again, and we need to be careful of uh, simple, simplistic answers to them. Uh, but it seems to me that if you if you went back far enough into these ideologies, maybe even to Marxism, you will find that they have arisen from a profoundly Christianized society, and that the uh, the choice of a particular virtue or a particular way of of doing things, unfortunately, has laid aside certain other things which belong to the Christian society. Uh, but to talk about justice, to talk about freedom, these are Christian ideals. Uh, the same is true of individualism, for example. Uh, the, the power of the individual in Western culture, uh, I believe I'm right in saying, that there are authors who say this who are more learned than me, arise from the pages of the New Testament, where the, where the individual is cherished. Now, if you take that, that's fine. But if you take that and take it out of its context and don't recognise that the, the individual is cherished, but also the community is cherished, if you take its context away, 
you will end up with a perverted view of what justice is and what these other things are. Yeah, it relates to what we were talking about earlier. So, but in essence, I've sometimes said to people, look, if you want to pursue the doctrine of the individual, I can say, hooray, I'm glad you recognise me yeah, as an individual indeed. and I'm glad to be an individual. Indeed. But it obliges me to recognise you as an individual. Yes, you are on that side of politics. <laughs> uh, but yes, indeed. And it, it's not a one it has thing. that, no, indeed. I'm not paramount over other individuals because I'm recognised as an individual. The, uh, it's not a hierarchy yeah. in that sense. Mind you, the individual, what we do need to observe, and this is where sometimes uh, an excessive egalitarianism has gotten in the way, where people confuse equality with sameness. And not all, uh, there are differences between human beings, and that needs to be acknowledged if we want true equality. Uh, but, uh, uh, but I'm agreeing with you. On the other hand, as well as that strong sense of individual, which is characteristic of the, um, the liberal, uh, liberal nationals, sorry, I almost said country party then, uh, is characteristic of that, of that philosophy, needs to be balanced with a emphasis on community. Uh, I'm a great believer in trade unions. I'm not sure if they're the trade unions we have, but nonetheless, I'm a great believer in the union movement. I think it's immensely important that uh, people without a great deal of say in the community can get together and have their say. Uh, this uh, essential, if we, if we lost the union movement in this country or something like it, we would be in a bad way. So somehow we've got to balance the, the importance of the individual, the equal importance of the individual, with what you just said, together with the importance of community, not collectivism, that's community gone wrong, but community. And that brings us back to families, which I know you're really interested in. Well, I am very interested in them. No family, though, can work without something you mentioned a moment ago, forgiveness, because there will always be mistakes made, the wrong thing done, a moment of selfishness, a moment of flaring, dislike, even hatred. To recover, there has to be the capacity to forgive. And it seems to me that that's largely washed out of our society. I have a theory that it has a lot to do with identity politics and this loss of idea that dividing lines between good and bad lie somewhere here, uh, yeah. rather they now lie there. So yeah. if you dare to disagree with me, you must be wrong, um, even under the point where uh, you, know, you can't be forgiven, you're beyond the pale and you need to be cancelled. How do we get on in a society that has lost the concept of deep and true forgiveness? I think the starting point has to be, as far as I'm concerned, with what the Bible tells us about God. Um, I mean, one God who has made everything, all-powerful, all-knowing, a God of complete justice. Thank God, I want a God of justice. But then, astonishingly, a God of forgiveness? How is this possible? And any forgiveness, one of the transformative features of the Christian religion over the years has been the emphasis on forgiveness. When I say that, I'm not saying that Christian religion has been faultless or anything like this. We're made up of sinners. But the emphasis on forgiveness arising from what we call grace or love now, the Bible does talk about God is just. It also talks about God is love. And out of that love comes the capacity to forgive. Now, without it, given that we are human beings and therefore corrupted, as you rightly say, you can't have a, you can't have a, a school. You can't have a, a party. You can't have a club. And you definitely can't have a family. So we need to think more about forgiveness. We need to be people who will forgive, which requires transformation within. We need to be people who will forgive, and we need to be people who practice forgiveness. We also need to be people who understand what forgiveness means and entails. Um, and that brings in the other side to it, which is being sorry for what you have done and being willing to own up and to confess what you have done, that you may receive forgiveness. 
There's a lot to learn here. Uh, when we do marriage guidance courses, I hope we do a lot on this. I mean, most people can work out sex without it being told. But we certainly do need a lot on, on forgiveness and sorrow, owning up, which is not the same thing as remorse. So that there are things to think about here which would really be essential in, in an era when families are dissolving. I think we need to confront this issue. The difference between remorse and sorrow. Remorse is, oh dear, I got sprung, it's made a mess of things. Sorrow is, I genuinely regret this. Is that the difference? Yes. The word, the word I would use is repentance, uh, mm. but that may not be understood. But yes, remorse is that, that sense you have, oh, I've been caught out, I've done the wrong thing, oh, woe is me, I'm a bad man. You know, when conscience comes and, and, and slays you, remorse. But that's not the same thing as repentance. That's not the same thing as doing what you need to do about this, of recognising that you really have done the wrong thing and that you have no right to forgiveness. A remorseful person often thinks that they have the right to be forgiven, but no one ever has the right to be forgiven. A repentant person will say, I am not worthy to be forgiven. Would you please forgive me? but recognise that I don't deserve to be forgiven. I think that's the difference. And you may live with a remorseful person, you know, they, they do something, they get drunk once a week, whatever it is, and Monday morning they're always remorseful. That's not repentance. Repentance is saying, I'm not going to touch it again. Did you enjoy this episode? We cannot get good public policy out of a bad debate. If you value vital conversations like this one, please like, share, subscribe and join the conversation.